life after coronavirus. Some countries are considering issuing immunity passports for those who've recovered from the illness. The aim is to allow them to go back to a normal life. But would that work? And is it certain that their immunity would last? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome back to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. Now, we are all acclimatising to a new world of the coronavirus pandemic. People staying at home, businesses shuttered, economies walking towards a cliff edge. And we're all wondering when will we return to something approaching the old normal. For some people, immunity to COVID-19 could be a future gate pass, a passport back to work, riding public transport, flying on a plane, going out, shaking hands. Remember those days? Experts are studying antibody tests to see whether people who've already had coronavirus are no longer at risk, any risk of contracting it again. If so, they could have certificates that grant them freedom when the rest of us stay locked down. It sounds like a godsend solution, but it's not clear how reliable such a scheme would actually be. And scientists are uncertain about if and for how long reinfection would simply not become an issue. The UK's health secretary saying his government is looking into issuing so-called passports, immunity passports, to allow people to get back to work. Now, blood tests are designed to tell whether people have had the virus and are now immune. These tests are done by taking a blood sample and looking for the presence of the right COVID-19 antibodies. These could be, potentially be done at home with a finger prick and deliver results in as little as 20 minutes. We're currently working with nine companies who've offered these tests and evaluating their effectiveness. These antibody tests, blood tests, offer the hope that people who think they've had the disease will know they're immune and can get back to life as much as possible as normal. But they've got to work. There we are. Here we go. Let's bring in our guest today here on Inside Story from Oxford. We have Dominic Wilkinson. He's the Director of Medical Ethics at the University of Oxford, Uhero Centre for Practical Ethics. In Braunschweig, in Germany, we have Gerard Krauss. He's an epidemiologist at the Helms Holt Centre for Infection Research. And in Lancaster, we have Derek Gatherer. He's a virologist at the University of Lancaster. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Dominic Wilkinson, coming to you first there. Listening to Mr Hancock, it sounds very simple. You do a test at home, you prick the end of your finger, you are good to go. Will it work that well? Well, I think we don't know yet uh, whether it's going to be as simple as that. It does seem like an attractive way of, of stepping out of these great restrictions because, of course, at this point in time, it seems that some people might not need to be restricted because they've had the virus already and are no longer at risk of becoming unwell or of spreading it to others. Uh, if we could know who was in that category, uh, then that might represent a way forward, though there are some interesting scientific and ethical challenges. Gerard Krauss in Germany, it sounds on the face of it like a good idea because at least in theory, a percentage of people would be able to go back to work, if only with a certificate that doesn't necessarily last for that long. Well, it's not necessarily the question whether they're allowed to go back to work or not. It's also about the question under what conditions they're allowed to go back to work. We know nowadays that many, many times in hospitals, at least in Germany, medical officers need to uh, provide PCR nasal swabs to test whether they are positive or not. And in case they would be immune, we could assume that this procedure would not be necessary for them. So it's not only all or nothing, it's also about under what conditions you can go back to work. Derek Gatherer in Lancaster, is the political desire getting ahead of the science here? Um, I, I think that uh, politics and science are very intertwined um, at, at the moment. There's great pressure on, on governments to, to perform um, and uh, opposition groups are, are just waiting for them to make mistakes so that they can capitalise on this. Um, there are very few countries in Europe that, that have any signs of much difference to the other. So the, the epidemic trajectory 
in, in across all of Europe and, and North America seems to be fairly similar, uh, which indicates that the variation in policy that we see between some countries that are, that are in heavy lockdown, such as Spain and Italy in particular, and countries that are in somewhat lighter lockdown, uh, the, 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 the most obvious example of that is Sweden, um, there, there doesn't seem to be very much difference yet in, in the way that the epidemic uh, is going in those countries. Um, in Asia, um, Singapore and South Korea had, had, have had better success in controlling numbers, but there may be special circumstances there that um, we, we don't fully understand exactly why uh, it, it's gone better in those countries. And indeed, in Singapore, it seems to be slightly on the up again, uh, and also in Japan. But yes, there's, there's no doubt that this is a big um, political football at the moment. Dominic Wilkinson in Oxford, coming back to you. Correct me if I'm wrong here, they test for antibodies, they find that people have got immunity, but it's not uh, the gold standard of immunity. They can't say 100% yes, you are immune, you can go back to a normal life. Well, I think what we don't know about this infection, because it's new, by, by its nature, is whether, uh, whether the infection could come back again, whether it might come back and be as severe or even more severe on a second time, or whether indeed you could have a mild infection because you've got immunity, we have that for other viruses, um, but then be able to pass on the virus to other people who are not immune and make them seriously ill. So those are uh, questions that we don't have answers to yet. Gerard Krauss in Braunschweig, your country in Germany, you are testing tens of thousands of people. Is that prohibitively expensive? And what does Angela Merkel intend to do with the people who come back testing, displaying immunity? Well, first I must clarify the tens of thousands uh, that we are testing now for antibodies is not for the sake of identifying those who have immunity or not on an individual basis. This is for the sake of measuring the true prevalence of the, of the disease or the incidence, measuring the true uh, case fatality rate and measuring the true dynamic of the epidemic because the case counts don't reflect a proper image of it. So those are two different things. Nevertheless, I do believe that if uh, valid and validated tests are available, that the use case of yellow fever vaccination, for example, on an international scale, or also the use case of hepatitis B vaccination for medical health workers might quite well be applicable for this situation also, because even for vaccines, especially for hepatitis B, we don't know very much if on the individual basis an executed vaccine really releases really uh, protection. So the situation is not so much different from what we are used to do for vaccines. Derek Gatherer, coming back to you as well. This is kind of counterintuitive, I suspect, as well. Does it almost incentivize people to get the virus, therefore they go through the process, therefore they get tested, therefore they maybe get an immunity passport at the end of that instead of sitting at home either waiting to get it, waiting for the blow to hit, or just sitting at home and never getting it anyway. I, I think it would be very unwise for anybody to, to, to seek an infection in order to, to be tested positive. There's still a lot that we don't know about the, the, the clinical uh, effects of this virus. We know that it definitely does seem to be much worse in older people and in, and in certain, and certain high-risk groups. But we, we don't really know what the fatality rate is yet. The, the, the best data that we have comes probably from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, where they, they tested everybody on board. And of the 700 or so people that tested positive, about half of them had no symptoms at all. And in the remaining half, there, there was um, a, a range of symptoms from mild right, right up to extremely serious. And, and about seven people died uh, so far um, from that group. So the fatality rate uh, from that data set seems to be about 1%. So um, cert certainly set, setting out to get infected in order to obtain an immunity certificate is, uh, is a gamble that I, I don't think anybody really should seriously uh, contemplate at all, no. Um, uh, also, that there is the, the issue of potentially fake uh, immunity certificates. Um, if, if we are um, issuing wristbands or some other kind of um, certification to people to go back to work, then this is an enormous opportunity for, for organised crime to forge these things and, and start selling them um, uh, as they sell other fake documentation. So again, again, there's a, a lot of problems for, for governments on that score. 
Derek, I guess that takes us, uh, Dominic rather, I guess that takes us back to your earlier point about ethics. So there is, there is a chance here that people would abuse the system if and when it's brought in. But if you are issuing certification based on a home test, what's the difference between discriminating against a certain group of people and protecting another group of people? Well, yes, I mean, one of the interesting things about this possibility of testing and then releasing people from isolation is uh, that no longer is uh, the restrictions of this virus imposed evenly on everybody apart from essential workers. But now some people get to get free of these, these restrictions. And interestingly and ironically, those who've acquired the virus, perhaps because they weren't as good at staying isolated might suddenly be rewarded by being allowed out of quarantine. So there's some interesting uh, paradoxes there. Um, as has been pointed out, there, there might be incentives either to become immune or, or to have certification of, of being immune. The, the issues of, of forgeries are, in, in essence, no different to forgeries of, of any other important documentation, driver's license, passports. Um, an immunity passport would be no different. Gerard Krauss in Germany. In Italy, they're just about this week, I think it is, they're about to start testing 100,000 people in a very specific area because the gene pool in that area goes back generation upon generation upon generation. And they think there might be something in there to do with either genome sequencing or the DNA. If you do that and you drill down into a very big, in terms of numbers, a very big group of people in a small geographical area, you are creating or are you identifying a subspecies which should, in theory, surely, can I suggest to you, should take us into a very uncomfortable conversation about people who can not be touched by the coronavirus, really, and lots of other people who can, the old, the young, the people with underlying health issues? I'm not quite sure uh, which study you are talking about, so I have difficulties to comment on this. Um, are you referring to a situation in Germany or elsewhere? No, this is going on in Italy within the next week or so. Okay, so sorry for that i don't, just don't know enough about the concept and it, it's difficult for me now to comment on it uh, okay i, well, I understand that comment. i totally respect your answer derek can i move that on, that one on to you if you start examining different groups of people and you find that because of their immediate local but quite long-standing history they maybe are able to push back against the coronavirus are you creating a subset of people who are stronger bigger, better than the elderly, the young, the people who succumb to this? Well, I think we have to be very careful about, about stigmatising people, um, but either because they, they have a, a greater susceptibility to coronavirus. There's been some speculation uh, about variation in the, in the receptor for coronavirus. That's the molecule that it binds to in the lungs, and that perhaps some populations are more susceptible than others. It may well be, conversely, that this study can identify some populations that are more resistant than others. But th this, th this is for research purposes so that we can better develop treatments against the virus and, and it definitely shouldn't be used for any um, for any sinister social purposes. Sometimes some very stranger results can be, be turned up from this. For instance, um, we know, for instance, that a Ebola virus receptor, um, which is a cholesterol transport protein, there, there's a mutation in, in a small Canadian group in Nova Scotia uh, that, that, re that renders them partially uh, immune to Ebola virus. Of course, this has never actually been tested on this Canadian population. It's been it's been tested on cells that have been taken from them, and um, because they have this mutation that's a slight defect in their cholesterol transport protein, the Ebola virus cannot bind to that protein and therefore cannot enter their cells. And presumably, that would give them in a clinical context some some immunity. But that that's something which is then a, a guide to uh, pharmacologists who are working on drug treatments to prevent viruses entering cells. They can be guided by this kind of study. Gerard. Should we be approaching this from another point of view that says there is something better in the pipeline? It's this thing called digital contact tracing, where if you've come out the other end and you become fit and well having had the coronavirus, you basically get 
a green light, a green card, something on your phone, it's an app, and using satellite technology and GPS technology, the relevant authorities can talk to your local supermarket and say, yes, you're green, you can go shopping, you can go back to work, or you're still red, so you've basically got to stay away from everyone. Well, personally, I'm, I'm very hesitant on those kind of approaches, very really kind of big brother-like of approach. And I think we shouldn't throw our, our human rights and personal rights overboard uh, because of this pandemic. So um, I'm very hesitant in those kind of approaches. I think there are other ways. It is true that if we go this way of an immunity pass, we would probably not rely on home testing kits because we would need to have uh, assurance of quality approval and quality control. So a self-made home testing kit wouldn't be able to do that. Um, secondly, we would need some sort of certificate that is maybe a bit more modern, a bit more uh, 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 more secure against uh, against uh, changes and manual changes as the common used uh, paper based yellow yellow fever cat that we know that everybody has when when he or she travels to South America or Africa so that something between must be developed I would really think it is the role of WHO to develop such a concept not the test the test is for the industry and for science to be developed and also to be validated but the concept is something that supranational organizations such as WHO, WHO typically should develop and elaborate and then provide procedures so that not every country is develop their own, developing their own conflicting standards. Dominic Wilkinson, how would you codify the shelf life of the certificate? Because, for example, anyone who lived through the SARS epidemic got it but got well. Within a year, some people were getting reinfected. Well, I think these are these are questions that we will have to to answer, and we won't be able to answer except with time. Uh, there's a huge impatience because I mean, this this is completely novel, uh, but has within a, the space of a couple of months shut down uh, large parts of the world and large parts of our economy. And there's huge impatience to be able to return to normal life. Uh, and I, of course, the the challenge is that we want to do that as soon as possible, but we don't want to do it too soon. Uh, one of the interesting things is that different countries are going to take different approaches to this. And so we, we're going to learn to some extent from, from the experiments that different countries are making. So you mentioned Sweden already compared with other parts of Europe. We're going to have the chance to learn if, if the Swedish approach is as, as effective as, as the approaches in other countries. And some of these questions about immunity passports or using digital passports, uh, there may well be countries that use these uh, that aren't perhaps afraid of the civil liberties concerns that have been mentioned. Uh, and we will see whether, in fact, that's an advantage, whether it allows their economies to return uh, or whether there are risks associated with it, including of prematurely breaking free of restrictions and the virus taking force again in the community. Is it just not going to work properly, Derek, in Lancaster, because until it gets to, or if it gets to the stage of, say, having like a, a yellow fever certificate in your passport, because that's what it's got to be, that, that's a belt and braces exercise when it comes to not being able to get something. Uh, well, yellow fever is an interesting example to use because yellow fever vaccine is one of the, the, the most reliable vaccines that we have in our, in our armory and you get quite good long term immunity um, uh, with that. So if you have a yellow fever vaccine certificate in your passport, that, that probably says something rather definite about your immune status against yellow fever. Um, on the other hand, the, the antibody tests for coronavirus don't have that degree, don't provide that degree of certainty. Uh, the, the FDA, the, the agency that approves um, all drugs and treatments in the USA, has just approved um, an antibody test which will start to be used in the USA. And the manufacturers claim it has 91% specificity, uh, which means that 9% of the positives won't, won't be true positive. So 9% of the people that come up positive and are, would be issued with a, um, an immunity certificate on that basis uh, would actually not be 
positive. And, and there are other examples of, of unreliability of, of antibody tests. For instance, to give you an example from Ebola virus again, um, we know that there's been uh, Ebola virus outbreaks in the Congo and neighbouring countries, and we had a big outbreak in West Africa a few years ago. But if, if you test for Ebola antibodies um, right across tropical Africa, um, you, you find lots of communities where there are fairly high levels of seropositivity, as we say, that's the, the state of being of having antibodies against the virus for Ebola. So w what does that imply? Does it imply that we have unrecognised Ebola outbreaks that have occurred at some point in the past in Africa? Or, or is it just that we have a problem with the accuracy of the tests? And um, as far as Ebola virus goes, it's still quite a controversial subject. Um, many people will argue that, that, that those tests aren't really reliable and that we should rely only on places where we know uh, that Ebola virus outbreaks ha have occurred and that the rest of the people aren't really immune to uh, Ebola virus after all. So with coronavirus, it, it might be equally difficult using antibody testing to truly establish who's immune and, and who isn't. Jared Krause, who should be in the driving seat with this one? Should it be the doctors, should it be the scientists, or should it be the politicians? I mean, some Canadian experts just in the past 24 hours, they're saying, actually, immunity passports, pretty good idea. They're waiting for the politicians to say, it's a good idea, and the politicians are waiting for the doctors to say, it's a good idea. No, I think, uh, no, what was just been said is absolutely right. And I do believe that the current tests that we have available and that are in the pipeline do not have the necess necessary precision yet to use it for such a certificate. So I agree on that point completely, but I would hope that a better tests would become available in the next month. They would have to be validated by scientific, uh, scientific uh, institutions and by the regulatory institutions. So that is clear who has that role. It would have to be the politicians to decide whether they want to use that as a technical basis to implement it for certain measures. And it would have to be the individuals to decide whether they would like to have this test to be done. So I think that roles are quite clearly separated. And again, I would think that WHO would be in the driver's seat to develop a concept so that those concepts are fairly similar, similar to the international health regulations, really. And that's what it's there for. So I think um, the roles are quite clear who has to take responsibility for what. At this very moment, we do not have the tests available that have the necessary precision. I agree fully on that. I would hope that it would come available in the next future. We will then also have data available that would tell us better for how long this immunity might be persisting. Uh, because also with vaccines, uh, we have the problem that for some viruses and bacteria, the vaccine is not very long lasting. Okay. Just think uh, of it. I just want to put a couple of final thoughts. First one to Dominic Wilkinson in Oxford. Between one third and one half of the global population is in effect locked down at the moment, or they're in some form of lockdown. We're constantly being told we will probably have a vaccine by next January or February. How long until we have certificates saying, yes, you're OK, you can go back to normal? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody knows when we're going to have the technology available to do this, the science uh, that, that informs us whether this is wise, uh, and a, a system in place that's going to be reliable enough to implement that. So those things have all got to be, got to be there. And when that's going to be available, uh, I wouldn't like to hazard a guess. Very briefly, Derek, in about 20 seconds, can it work or will it have to be part of an overall arsenal? Um, I, I think it will have to be part of an overall arsenal. And, and I think that nat natural herd immunity uh, as well will play a big part in bringing this outbreak to an end. In many countries in the world, they simply cannot implement lockdown. Populations live under too, too crowded conditions. And in parts of Africa and other poor parts of the world, um, the epidemic will simply just sweep across them and the population will acquire herd immunity and, and eventually that, that will happen in Europe as well. Um, we can manage it via lockdown and release, um, but in the absence of a treatment or a vaccine, we will get herd immunity as well. Gentlemen, we must leave it there. Thank you so much for your contribution to this ongoing debate.
here on Al Jazeera and indeed, of course, around the world. Thank you very much. They were our guests. They were Dominic Wilkinson, Gerard Krauss and Derek Gatherer. And thank you, too, for your company. You can see the program again anytime you want via the website aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby one from me, Peter Dobby, and everyone on the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.